something that's been a consistent theme, I think, throughout today, which is to, to stop thinking about individual microservices and start thinking about how you build larger and more complicated systems which are composed together to deliver an end user service and, of course, deliver that service at scale. Luca, come on up on stage. Good afternoon, America. If I was in the morning, I would say good morning, America, so that my friend Colin could, uh, could have a good laugh. Um, well, I think you heard already a few of the things that I, you will see in my presentation, but it comes actually from experience of running distributed system for some time. So I call it swimming in the microservices ocean because we're going to talk about swim. So, but the original talk actually wanted to be more an holistic view of uh, what is at the moment the microservices ocean. So I work actually for near four, like a uh, few people here around. And uh, you can find me actually everywhere on the web uh, with my name and surname. The surname is Maraski, not she. Um, and uh, I actually have been active for some time into the dark side of Node, that is the post-mortem um, working group. So basically when your Node.js process crashes, usually you want to do post-mortem, and that's basically what I was into that. So like everybody, I always had a dream. And uh, uh, oh, this one is wrong. Uh, I should mention actually one thing. I lost a bet uh, two weeks ago. So if you follow me on Twitter, you will see every day that I post a link uh, to a uh, GitHub issue because I need to write 100 unit tests in the next 100 days. That's my, the price of losing a bet with your coworkers. Um, but actually, back to my dream. I actually wanted always to have uh, a scalable and resilient uh, system. And almost with no maintenance. A little bit like having a room at home, you know? When you come back after traveling and you find your house covered of dust, I wish I had a Roomba, but unfortunately, it's myself with a Dyson cleaning. So I'm not resilient, not scalable, and I'm very high maintenance. So like every good story, and it's not going to be a good night nice story, unfortunately, because it's too early for that. Uh, once upon a time, everybody actually went through the pain of the monolith. And uh, you should actually Google monolith and see all the beautiful images that are coming out. So, but we all know that this thing didn't really work. It was not scalable, so it was really thumbs down to that. So many, many years ago, and I'm not so, so old, unfortunately, um, I was actually studying Latin and Greek. And one thing that actually really caught me at the time was this simple principle that is one of the core principle of uh, um, modern warfare and so on. And it's dividet et impera. And I actually, when I was at MIT, I got back to the same principle, studying nuclear physics. And that one actually means very, very simply, and it was uh, Philip of Macedonia that actually came out with this concept. He said, if I can actually divide the problem in very, very simple, easy to control problems, I can attack and win the war. And that's how microservices were born, right? So we took the, the monolith, we slayer it, and we made tiny, tiny, small, controllable, independent components. And uh, microservices became actually a hipster movement. Everybody was talking about microservices. So I'm a very outspoken person, so I have no problem to say even at a near form event that I'm not a strong believer of microservices in their term. So that's why I think they're hipster, but though this picture was really awesome. Um, the colors, they look very nice on the slide. So we all actually were in this illusion that uh, microservices, they were stateless, right? And uh, along this way, actually, we forgot that microservices, actually, they were not actually super, super stateless because they just put the state in a centralized place in what most of the people call the single point of failure. And for example, in a simple um, microservice architecture, um, I didn't put Nginx because I always mention Nginx, and I think HAProxy should also deserve a space in some slides. So there was a proxy with a lot of uh, uh, nice microservices, and then my state was actually persisted in is persisted in Redis uh, with Trend Proxy or React. Um, I didn't put Cassandra, as you notice, uh, so just a React. Um, so the concept actually of stateless kind of uh, killed the concept of resiliency because clearly we are not actually super fault tolerant because we have a single point of failure that is still our session storage. And uh, still at the time of high school, long time ago. 
I uh, translated actually a lot of pieces of Seneca. And uh, uh, I was actually kind of captured by this sentence that they say, as long as you live, uh, keep learning how to live. And it was actually beautiful. I never understood exactly what really meant until getting older and wiser. But one thing that I actually understood is that uh, my service they might die, and the hell is going to be how I can find them in my infrastructure. So the eternal problem of service discovery. So and we all know, console, HCD, they are a solution. You can play also around with Nginx and all kinds of smart tricks of making searching yourself within yourself, looping back and asking Nginx uh, to, uh, to tell where your other peer is. But at the end of the day, what is really missing is the concept of coordination. And you know, if you're running a business, you clearly want to be successful. And being successful means having more people. More people means more server. And then you go into the, what I call it, the logistic problem. And the logistic problem is a kind of uh, um, cross-company, cross-organization problem. It goes from what DevOps needs to maintain to basically how I can do traffic management of my services, and so on and so forth. And to all this big equation, our best friend Amazon came across in the cloud and they say, well, we solved the problem of scalability. And they introduced some beautiful services like Auto Scaling Group and uh, ELB. If you listen to some of my talks, you know that I'm not a big friend of the ELB. I think it's a stupid component because it's not programmable. And I like to program stuff. I like to control them because I want to be mine and exactly tailor me to what I want. And uh, uh, recently, well, not so recently, um, the world of container and you know uh, unikernel and so on came came along our way. And um, apart actually being a fantastic photo, this one, it's a beautiful long exposure uh, of the um, harbor of Rotterdam. Um, it actually represents exactly what scaling container means, right? It's super, super complex to coordinate them. And our best friend Docker kind of came out with this beautiful propaganda say, yeah, we containerize your application. We make everything simple. We give you an overlay network with Swarm, or you put it in Kubernetes and everything is solved. But then actually what every, every, everyone uh, forgot was actually the problem of uh, how to basically bring this container to life. So all the life cycle of uh, uh, delivery. And all the, actually this complexity still could not actually solve uh, the resiliency and the fault tolerance that we are looking in our large scale distributed application. And when I speak about large scale distributed application, unfortunately, I speak about few players in the market like Uber, Netflix, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, well, Twitter. Um, and you know, this one, they are large scale. We're talking about millions of users. So that's the problem that they needed to solve uh, um, at scale, both organizationally and, via, and also in their code. And most of microservice architecture, they still suffer of uh, the heartbeating problem. So failure detection is detected via heartbeating. Do you know what heartbeating is? Well, it's the reason why we are all here and we're still alive, because we have something that <laughs> pumps blood. But actually, in system, it's just a simple way. It's a ping pong message. So I just ping a peer, and I get the pong back. And I, if your replies is alive. We all know that this one is a stupid idea, right? Because it depends what you do. For example, if you are server-side rendering, your heart beating needs different information than if you are doing just a simple API, so if you are reading data from a database. and. Uh, the main problem is that you, you massively scale, you add more containers, but the problem is still the state. How do I actually keep the state of my cluster uh, consistent and how I actually can uh, manage it uh, consistently along the time? And uh, that's actually the academical part. Uh, uh, some people from Cornwall came out with, um, I think, actually the, the most uh, interesting white paper I ever read that is actually SWIM. Um, how many of you know about swim, except the word swimming in the ocean? Um, so swim, actually, it's, uh, um, let, let's make it simple. How many of you are watching movies? Everybody, right? Is Yunong in the room? No, OK. So how many of you are downloading BitTorrent or this kind of thing? 
So it's the same stuff. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? The, the peer-to-peer -peer network is built just in uh, distributing the data across different uh, nodes. And um, SWIM actually means scalable, weekly, consistent, infection style, membership protocol. Let's take it one by one so that you understand why it's powerful. So weekly consistent is because if you want to have a, a distributed system cannot be strongly consistent. It's very simple. It's, it takes too much time to be strongly consistent. And how many of you actually have a bank account? Everybody, right? You all get paid. So even banks, they're uh, eventually consistent, weekly consistent. So every time that you make a transaction, actually this transaction is processed in a batch later on. But they make a guess on the change of your state. Um, the, the interesting part of SWIM is actually the failure detection over the cluster because uh, actually is a cooperative uh, uh, task. So every peer in the network is going to cooperate on determining the state and the faultiness of other nodes in the cluster. It's, uh, it's kind of complex, but if you imagine if you have five cluster nodes, these five cluster nodes, they all cooperate to determine if the, each other they are healthy or unhealthy. And inform, uh, information dissemination means that your state actually is rotating across the entire cluster. So it's not actually static in a single node, but everybody is, uh, has that information over and over and over again. But the most interesting part is that the distribution is solved in an e uh, equal way. So if you want to build actually this kind of super smart uh, uh, load balancing algorithm, uh, Zwim actually, because of its fault tolerance, can allow you to build uh, uh, crazily uh, performant uh, uh, balancing algorithm. So not round robin anymore. Um, the nicest thing is that it was born actually for solving the problem of distribution of Google data center. And all it sounds super magic, right? But at the end of the day, there's still a problem to solve. What the hell is going to happen when I, would, when I add a node to a cluster? So I have my five cluster nodes. I add an extra one. What is going to happen? Because the problem of rebalancing the topology also in Consul is the fact that you need to basically um, announce yourself. And Consul is going to basically announce, uh, well, receive your announce and just rebuild all the routing table around the, uh, the listener. But it's not actually a kind of very scalable uh, um, mechanism of basically distributed and workload. So I think actually one size fits all it doesn't really exist. So if you actually put together SWIM with a consistent hash ring, you have solved the magic. So how many of you know what a consistent hash ring is? Except Colin had already heard about the talk. OK, well, the consistent hash ring is, um, how many of you are using DynamoDB, S3? OK, well, they are all a consistent hash ring. So they've used basically a cons uh, hash path to basically uh, map data in, uh, um, in the cluster. And if you are interested on exactly understanding why it's called a hash ring, it's because um, it's not really clear, this image. That's why I didn't perceive my, pursue my career as a designer. Um, it's basically trying to basically uh, represent the fact that uh, uh, the cluster is uh, imagined as a kind of uh, circle where the distribution is based on shards. And every shard is basically a portion, a radiant of this circle. And they are equally distributed across the circle. So. Let's go a little bit practical. Uh, it's basically just a partitioning uh, strategy. And how many of you are using Oracle databases? Oracle, Oracle, nobody? No, keep your hands down. OK, so well, Oracle actually created, uh, uh, was the first one to introduce partitioning to database uh, at scale for only 100K a year. Um, so I think actually the, the, uh, the interesting part of the consistent hash ring uh, stays in the distribution of the application state. And now I'm going to just try to go a little bit deeper and let you understand what that means. Um, so we have, we have our application. And our application uh, is deployed on, let's say, 1,000 nodes. And this application basically needs to uh, return uh, some user information, like, for example, uh, the current uh, balance. Like, we are building a transactional system, so I want to return the balance of a user. And uh, the easy way to, to, uh, to see it is that I have basically all these nodes, and the information of my user is distributed across the cluster. And every single node owns uh, this uh, information of the state of a particular user. 
what happens is that the cluster is going to bounce across different nodes to find that information. And uh, how many of you actually heard of SURF? Well, we need to say Ashikov to push on the marketing strategy. So SURF is actually the technology behind Consul and behind many of their products. And it's actually how they distribute information across, the, for example, the Consul cluster. But let, let's actually try to, to see something more concrete because uh, I never liked when I was in university all these kind of lectures. They always bore me uh, a lot. So how many of you heard of Uber? Not because almost everybody resigned recently, but OK. How many of you are using Uber, by the way? OK, great. Now I explain to you how Uber works. Uh, Uber is built on top of Ringpop. So Ringpop was uh, the solution that Uber found uh, for uh, solving their scaling uh, problem for the dispatch API. Dispatch is whatever is the API that is called by mo your mobile app when you open the app and you say, I want an Uber driver. And uh, um, Ringpop has a small issue. It's tailor-made for Uber. So if you try to push it in your application, it might sound a little bit overkilling. So that's why actually um, Matteo and recently me started actually working on uh, an alternative library called Upring. I highly recommend you to uh, check it out because we are, it's a very, very lightweight implementation of a Swim and a consistent hashing. And we are actually building, we have a PubSar system fully working on Upring, super beautiful. But the main concept is that what they did, they actually said, well, instead of implementing sharding in the data, we implement sharding in the application. So a full layer seven sharding uh, uh, implementation. And uh, what actually they needed to, um, what actually they needed to, uh, to solve was a distribution in a very strongly consistent environment. Because every time that you open Uber is a transaction. So it has to be strongly consistent because um, I don't know if you ever tried to do this, uh, this trick. If you, if, actually, if your credit card gets canceled and you open Uber, Uber will ask you for an alternative way of payment because they cannot pre-book uh, the ride on your credit card. Recently, is actually that what they actually are trying to solve, they say, well, we have uh, 10 million users. We cannot actually hit uh, with these 10 million users only a few servers. So we segregate uh, uh, partition of servers and applications for a certain set of users. And basically what they do, they say, for example, from the user from 0 to 100, we go to this uh, node instance cluster. And for the range 200 to 200 to that one, and so on and so forth. And that's basically how they shard uh, and they distribute uh, uh, the load in their cluster. Because they get actually 22 million messages per second. So it would be impossible for them to handle it on a single cluster. On top of that, um, Uber build Hyperban. And Hyperban is um, a super interesting uh, uh, piece uh, of uh, software. It's an overlay network. How many of you are familiar with what an overlay network is? OK, if you build a distributed system and you heard a lot of things of microservices today, the core of actually having high scalable um, uh, distributed system is actually the overlay network. And it's what actually Kubernetes has embedded in their, uh, in their system. Is the only way that you can abstract the complexity of physical network, and you can make it programmable. So, well, Uber, they don't run on Kubernetes, clearly, because they have the syndrome of reinventing the wheel. Um, so they actually build Hyperban. And Hyperban is just a, a kind of overlay network that enables service discovery. What happens is that every time that a new peer comes up, uh, the gossip goes on a network where every single peer gets uh, a virtual IP address uh, and they get remapped and, they, and you can query the overlay network to get the physical location of that specific machine. Um, there is actually some kind of dark side, not in Uber, uh, just in Hyperbound, um, being the fact that it's uh, so unreadable, the code, that you barely want to use it. Uh, and is extremely intertwined with another uh, piece that they build, that is T-channel, that I think actually is the breakthrough technology in, uh, um, in recent time. So Uber actually said, and I completely believe that, why do we go on HTTP communication when we can just terminate it? And we can just call everything in our cluster as a function through RPC via TCP. So they could actually reduce the package. And for them, the core 
is actually traceability. So if you see is a general RPC protocol that handles out of order responses. So basically it doesn't, it's not a request response mechanism, but it's just out of order. You never know when you will get the response back. And uh, the um, implements actually the decision for word pattern in the protocol. But the interesting part is that it's highly traceable. And I don't know how many services they are running in Uber, but I think many thousand. Uh, for them, traceability is clearly a core. Because actually, they don't want to end up in this situation. And I don't know how many of you could, uh, can actually um, feel what this image is, but um, I actually have been uh, uh, struggling once in uh, my previous uh, distributed architecture uh, job to actually have to track and trace uh, a request that was lost, and it was a transaction. And it was actually a fraudulent transaction in our system. So in order not to go in trouble, we had to trace it. And uh, it was a chaos because we had something like 200 microservices that they were communicating across the HTTP, and this transaction could not actually be tracked down. So basically, the middle of the night uh, operation was actually trying to find the transaction something like this. And uh, um, that's the moment that I start actually to research something that was very highlighting for uh, the world of microservices for me and distributed architecture. And it's actually uh, the Dapper uh, protocol. Is anybody of you aware of what Dapper is? So Dapper is a, P is a white paper from Google and is actually um, a protocol that um, uh, tried to describe and formalize uh, distributed tracing. Um, just, just to give you an idea, how many of you actually are tracing requests in your microservices environment? And what are you using? Okay. okay. You too. Okay. Well, too bad. Uh, <laughs> so um, Zipkin is, I think is by far, so every time that somebody comes to one of my talks, I said just, sleep until I don't mention Zipkin, note down the name, uh, Google it, and then you can leave. Um, Zipkin actually is, if you are not using it, just use it. Just use it. If you don't want to actually end up uh, doing something that I saw happening a few times, uh, I was in an environment where people were sending data to Splunk, that is not cheap, so you want to send it right, or to Elasticsearch, so to a health stack, and spending days try to find, uh, to reconstruct transaction and request. Well, Zipkin does it all by himself, has a beautiful UI, it's easy to install, you can doc is uh, dockerized, and the uh, most interesting part is that it coordinates all the requests. So it's basically a time consistent series, uh, is, uh, sorry, transaction there are, and requests that are represented in a time consistent way. So you can basically reconstruct them anytime. Um, so note it down, download it, install it, implement it. Um, so the, what actually was uh, the main takeout from uh, uh, learning how actually uh, Uber and uh, uh, distributed architecture, they migrate from microservice HTTP only, was actually for me the fact that I questioned myself why actually Uber decided to go for RPC. And I think actually that's the most brilliant uh, uh, decision that they made uh, because I'm a strong believer that uh, um, in the modern times, actually, we are trying to reinvent the wheel many, many times, building services and try to reimplement security and so on. But at the end of the day, if you want to optimize our development process, we are just running a lot of function in a cluster. That's what we are doing. We are just building very simple input-output function. And I just had before a chat with uh, some guys about Lambda. And even if I'm completely against Lambda because I think it's stupid, because I cannot test it locally, and living on an airplane, that's a problem because I cannot connect to Amazon to ask is my function working or not. Um, I think actually Uber embraced actually a, a great philosophy, the one of turning uh, services into just simple input output function in a cluster, completely managed by the application container being, in this case, the ring pop application. And, uh, you know, we spoke about Lambda. Lambda is a great thing. It's a first step of bringing this function inside of uh, 
uh, cloud environment. There are many other alternatives. I don't know if you guys are interested in alternatives of Lambda. You should. Uh, one of them being uh, uh, IBM uh, uh, OpenWhisk. I highly not recommend it because it's um, you know a little bit closed source. Um, but on the other side, actually, um, if you are interested actually in Lambda and uh, distribute function, a very interesting project coming up is Iron Functions from Iron.io. The company didn't bankrupt yet. It was they were they were rescued by a last minute investment to run this project called Iron Function. Check it out. It's written in Go. And every function is embedded in a Docker container. It's super smart. And uh, um, you know, Lambda actually introduced this beautiful word that it was serverless. And I heard also then framework serverless. How many of you are using serverless framework? Except the people that I met before. OK. Do you like it? OK. I always like with cloud formation all the time. No. <laughs> Um, well, actually, the fact is that um, I believe actually that serverless became a very, very hipster term uh, nowadays. Uh, but if you're actually looking into this kind of mass, massive scale application, uh, you should actually really looking into converting your stack uh, more into what Uber uh, was um, already did and they are continuing doing. Um, because actually, at the end of the day, if you want to scale, you need to just think that your business logic and your services are dying and becoming just a bunch of functions running inside of whatever container it is. And uh, after this long opinionated view of uh, Lambda, uh, I thank you. But most important thing, you need to check out the three things. So everybody with paper and pen note down. Zipkin, if you're not using it. Second one, Upring. It's a great library. And follow me on Twitter and save me from writing 100 unit tests. So if I get a lot of tweets to save me, I don't have to write them. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>